Well, I have to admit, and it may mark me out as a bit of a nerd, I, I actually got interested in public health as a medical student. Mm -hmm. That's not to say I didn't enjoy clinical medicine as I was learning it as a student, but I think by the time I was in fourth year or final year, I recognised that I needed to think about problems differently, and I started just exploring for myself by reading a few books that were around at the time. Uh, because to be honest, I didn't get a lot out of the lectures and the formal classes that we went through, but it was only by exploring for myself uh, that I realised that there was a different way of thinking about um, health problems. Uh, and to me, that was much more rewarding. I would have to say that it is getting the balance right at government level between the interests of between corporate interests and public health. Um, I remember talking at a meeting a couple of years ago, um, an NPRI meeting in Leeds, I think it was, uh, where I did a little bit of research about um, what Abraham Lincoln did in uh, emancipating slaves in the US and pushing through, I think it was the 14th Amendment in the uh, US Constitution, which actually emancipated the slaves. But he actually predicted, and he was proved right, that this particular amendment, because of the, wor the way it was worded, was going to give a, a free hand to large corporations. And I couldn't quote verbatim what Lincoln said at the time, but he predicted that one of the future challenges to society and its health would be the fight against corporate interests. Well, the Centre for Public Health is one of uh, four large research centres within the medical school. Uh, and in 2008, uh, we were successful in winning one of the UK CRC Centres of Excellence Awards. Um, and I guess at the time when the call came out uh, to make those awards, the funders wanted to fund centres were, which could add value to their mission of capacity building and building capacity in intervention research. And I would have to admit that we didn't have a, national, a nationally recognised mega strength in those areas. And I remember talking to one of your former uh, informants, uh, Professor Martin McKee, about why he felt the London School of Hygiene might not make a bid. Um, and that was because he thought they were so far ahead of many of the rest of the uh, units in the UK that they couldn't add value. Whereas coming from a, a moderate base, we thought we could add value in that mission to build capacity and to develop some novel interventions. And I suppose being one of the Celtic fringe nations, where things in government and the statutory sector are reasonably well connected together, we thought we could uh, show the type of partnership working that was possible and that the funders were interested in. Well, I, I, I guess it is in the area of capacity development. Um, I would say scientists who believe that they're going to split the atom uh, are very few in terms of realising that ambition. But I've often thought about what impact I might have as I approach retirement or when I'm on my deathbed. And I think I would like to look back and say that it was about changing minds, about developing people. And I'm pleased to say that this award of the Centre of Excellence has allowed us to bring on very talented young people who now have ambition to achieve and to, and to make a difference by working in a new transdisciplinary way. We have so many different disciplines represented in the centre. To take for example, um, trying to understand how social networks and social connections influence health. We now have psychologists and mathematicians working together on that problem to see not only how we would analyse it, 
but also what theories would give us explanatory in integration. So bringing together different disciplines has been something that I'm, that I'm proud of and allowing each other to respect their discipline and work together. Well, for anybody who has read the Marmot Report, um, this won't be solved by one thing. And I can therefore only draw on my own personal reflections about my own life course, because Marmot in his report does take a life course perspective, emphasizing early years interventions and convinced that that's right. But from a personal perspective, from a working class background myself, I think about the small opportunities that initially my mother gave, gave me. For example, for example, and in the early 1960s, I went to nursery school. Now, how many working class kids in Sink Estates today could go to a nursery school? And that was not about didactic learning. It was probably about socialising and developing some form of early emotional intelligence that then equipped me to learn at primary school. And let me give you the example of primary school in the 1960s. We had a very, very forward-thinking um, headmaster. And this was a primary school that had been built by the local linen mill for the workers of the early 19th century. So it was, it was a working class primary school. But this headmaster travelled to my country town from Belfast with these forward-thinking ideas. So we were taught foreign languages in primary school in the 1960s. I mean, that's happening now, maybe, in some working class areas. But that's how someone was able to inspire us. So I'm not saying that Michael Gould got everything right, because I'm sure that he didn't get everything right, but I think education policy is going to make a big difference to inequalities. It will not solve them all, and that's why Marmot has so many other things in his report. But looking back and personally reflecting on what made a difference to my life, it would be education. Well, the PARC study, spelt P-A-R-C, Physical Activity Rejuvenating Conswater, uh, is a study of the impact of an urban regeneration in a working class deprived part of East Belfast. East Belfast is part of the city where there are still some peace walls dividing Protestant and Catholic areas, but both equally suffering multiple deprivation. However, on the fringes of that, uh, deprived area, there are some very well-off areas as well, so it, it, it shows the full spectrum. Now, in 2008, the local community partnerships succeeded in winning a big lottery award to redevelop, or, or to regenerate the area and to create the Collinswater Community Greenway. So this was going to be the creation of new urban green space. Uh, and built environment changes to uh, improve the amenities of the area as well as improving the green space but also towpaths, new towpaths around three, um, three rivers in East Belfast that were in a sorry state. And so the initial investment was the winning of the big lottery award and on the back of that we applied to the NPRI uh, funding scheme to evaluate the impact. Now admittedly because the Greenway was a central part of it, we were interested in looking at changes in physical activity before and after the construction. Yeah. Now the construction phase is only being completed in the coming 15 months. So what we've done so far is a household survey in the area affected uh, before the construction began a couple of years ago. But we're looking at a range of different parameters, obviously physical and mental health and mental well-being, but also social capital. Um, and we have a number of different people with different skill sets looking at uh, broader impacts, for example. Um, we have had one uh, PhD student looking at a social return on investment, which looks at a very broad slate of impacts on the local economy, on tourism, on uh, uh, fauna and flora mm -hmm. in the green space, 
the, the green environment, uh, and also on health. And uh, I think the social return on investment approach to some urban regeneration is long overdue because these things are interconnected. We can't just say that the impact on health will be mediated only by physical activity if people start to use the greenway because it will be about connecting people, uh, changes in social capital uh, and I think that could impact uh, indirectly on the health of the population as well. But I think the benefits of doing such an evaluation are to demonstrate to government the potential return on investments like this to regenerate areas. So when we set out on the evaluation we, like the Scottish Centre here, have taken a, a greater interest in the impacts of urban regeneration and we have uh, another uh, PhD student looking at urban regeneration schemes, schemes across Northern Ireland and the potential impacts using difference and difference approaches. Uh, but that's in a very early stage, that other work is in a very early stage. But some of the lessons that we've learned from the park study have paid dividends in the way we think about knowledge translation and knowledge exchange, working with research users, because we've given lots of um, uh, seminars directly to policy makers and directly to the decision makers in a variety of government departments. And so that park study has taught us, I hope, how to do that a little bit better. Well, as I said earlier, I chose my uh, career option very early on, before I left medical school. Uh, but if you turn the clock even further back, when I filled in my UCA form for university, <laughs> it's not that I was schizophrenic, but I had five different choices uh, for what to study at uh, university. And engineering was one of them. If I wasn't in medicine, perhaps I would like to be a problem solver in some form, form of field in engineering. Um, if I had remained in another specialty in medicine, perhaps it would have been neurology. Again, that's a problem-solving specialty, but I would like to hope that I had some people skills because I realised that in neurology it's all about empathy and taking the patient through a, a journey because unfortunately there's still very few cures in neurology. Uh, so if I was in medicine in another discipline, possibly neurology, if I wasn't in medicine and in another profession, engineering, and if I wasn't in a profession, I'd like to have been a professional golfer, but sadly my children would have little on their table to feed them.